Hello and welcome to the Skyland Aspires Adventure Developer Commentary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the software engineer, Robert Leyland. It's kind of fun to dig up old memories. Yeah. What was your position during development? Um, initially, um, and for most of my uh, work at Toys for Bob, I was a, a software engineer, um, basically a computer programmer working on, on video games. Um, we worked on a number of video games prior to Skylanders. Um, were uh, they ranging from, uh, like I worked with Paul and Fred on the original version of Star Control, um, and then subsequently on um, uh, uh, quite a few titles that they, they did. I, I ended up working there full time from uh, the period of Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure onwards. The Extreme Skate, uh, Disney's Skate Adventure was a skateboarding game that was set in uh, Disney Universe worlds. Um, and then we did a number of other titles, Madagascar, um, uh, Downhill Jam, which was once again skateboarding. Um, Madagascar is probably closer to Skylanders. It's a, a kind of a kid-friendly game set in the Madagascar, the, mo the movie Madagascar universe. Um, and then we, we got going on Skylanders. And uh, in the initial period of Skylanders, um, we were doing, bouncing around a whole bunch of ideas, and uh, the the we had come out at that point, and everybody was enamored with the idea of alternate um, input devices. Um, you know, this ranged from um, uh, an egg on your head to uh, like a hat that you you wore to to a, a whole variety of things. And um, at some point, uh, and I don't even remember who it was, but it kind of came up. One of the one of the guys, I think Iwe uh, and a few of the others, had been uh, making uh, uh, models with casting. Um, this is sort of uh, resin and um, uh, plastic casting, basically pouring into molds. So they're making rubber molds and making little little critters with them. And some of those became the first Skylanders. But uh, the idea was, you know, we were enjoying playing with the playing with them, and people were having fun pouring these little molds and making hand carving and making molds. And uh, we thought, you know, maybe we should like connect these to the video game. And uh, um, uh, the the initial idea was to have some kind of electrical contact that would identify them. Um, and we'd go and we we, you know, we wanted to connect it to the Wii, and we, we you know we had some ideas. And I said, hey, you know, um, I, I can I might be able to do that. And uh, I worked on a connection uh, electrical connection system using the Wii remote and uh, um, and an RFID reader. And uh, what it meant was reading RFID tags um, using an Arduino and communicating with I to C, sorry if I'm getting technical, um, to the Wii mode, and then, re then um, getting that input in the Wii so that um, we could distinguish between individual toys by putting an RFID tag on the base of them. And... Uh, um, that was pretty successful, and people were really happy with how well that felt. And uh, Dan Gerstein, who was one of the um, primary um, designers, um, particularly user interface designer, really went to town with it and did a lot of work to make that transition, the feeling of putting your toy on the, of reading your toy and then having it appear in the game to be as smooth and fast as possible because you really, that, that added so greatly to the experience. Uh, so uh, th this is a really long answer, but basically I started <laughs> yeah, and ended as a hardware engineer <laughs> as do doing electronics and uh, right. embedded programming. Yeah. Right, so you said like you had the idea of like a hat on your head kind of thing, an egg on your head. Was that the idea? Was it an actual physical hat on your head? Or... <laughs> yes, yes, there was a Okay, so what was that? How was that going to work in the game? Oh, it, it was pre, it was pre, uh, <clears throat> pre Spyro, pre Skylanders. We were, we were kind of just thinking, uh, brainstorming. Um, there was another one involving uh, hatching an egg. Um, uh, you know that you'd have like this football thing. I mean, that you're talking about something that's like ten plus years ago, and that <laughs> only, only, uh, you know, I think we thought about it for less than a few days. It's like right. No, work. <laughs> But the idea that you might have to wear a hat while playing a game seemed kind of silly and fun. And maybe you aimed with it or something. Well, you know, who knows? I actually don't remember. There was something, I do remember there was something about balancing 
you know, you have to balance the hat on your head, I think. Anyway, I, it's, it's a sidetrack. <laughs> I mean, it sounds amazing. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I would definitely, definitely be up for like seeing, like how you could expand that kind of idea. Yeah, because <laughs> it's it could be great. You could have it, you could have like a set of different miniature hats, and each hat has a different power or something. It could be awesome. <laughs> exactly. Oh, let me just change on my change and put my my spy versus spy hat or my yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just gonna don my fez. Yeah, it's gonna be great. <laughs> Oh, it'd be great. Fizz is wonderful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It'd be amazing. Uh, Doctor Who quote, Fizzes are cool. <laughs> yes, Fizzes are cool, as are bow ties. Yeah. Yeah, bow ties, yeah. <laughs> so, was this, you, you were saying you were working with uh, coding the, the game uh, to the Wii. Was this the first Wii game uh, that Toys R Bob worked on? Um, no, we had done... Uh... Oh, gosh, I've forgotten what we'd done. We had done a little bit of work with the Wii on one of the Madagascar titles, if I remember right. Oh no, Downhill Jam, because we used the um, uh, accelerometers in the um, in the Wii mode, and on, and at that point, Xbox and PlayStation also had accelerometers in their controllers, and we used those to for balancing for sliding down. Um, downhill Jam was a, a longboard downhill skating game, and you you zip trip, zip down long streets and boulevards and crazy stuff and cities around the world and uh the um accelerometers and the um uh it, within the controllers were used to control balance on the board i think they had an alt a backup mode that used the joystick but the accelerometers were way more fun and actually much more sensitive and easier to control than, uh, than the joystick was but um be that as it may we we had some experience with it and of course that's where the idea of you know adding balances and things like that came about. I think um, Activision actually followed up on that. They had a um, skateboarding product that was involved with Tony Hawk. That was actually a hard hardware skateboard that you could actually balance on. And uh, they built hardware prototypes. I'm not sure if they actually reached market or not. That's not a, a thing, but it was something that was pretty damn cool that they'd done. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, so yeah, you, you're coding the the hardware for the Wii with the toys. How how does that vary compared to uh, the other games for the Wii? Oh, I, quite a bit. I mean, the big thing, um, the, the big conceit with Skylanders was that your toys came to life, and um, uh, you know they they came out of the hardware, the physical world, and into the the game world. And uh, so we you know we generated a bunch of fiction, but you know to to support that but the the key was that you're programming um you're programming at a, the game knowing that at any time the kid the child playing the game actually a lot of adults play it too can remove the toy from the game so it's almost like it's an additional menu selection like you're you're um, um, it, it, it can interrupt the gameplay and they can change it and you've got to be ready to load and unload um, the toy data and all this kind of stuff at, at the drop of a hat. And it's got to be really fast and feel completely um, uh, magical. We, in fact, we, we called it the magic moment when, you, when your toy appeared in the game. And that was, we, we did a lot of work to support that including you know reading the data off the little RFID tags um, it takes a little bit of time um, in, in the order of a second or so to get all the data off and that second is long enough that a, um, a player will notice it so if we had read the data off the toy and then displayed the toy you as the player you'd feel a, like a one second delay before your toy appeared, before your character appeared in the game and so what we had to do was order the data on the tag RFID tag so that you could, as you read the data in, it was the next piece of data that it needed to load and display graphics on the screen. So the first thing that came in, of course, was the toy, toy's ID, the type of toy it was. And that caused it to display the name and, the, and an initial image and set some colors and start an animation and... Um, and while that animation is playing, we're, we're in the background busily reading and reading and reading the rest of the data until we've got all the stats and the... And because on, on the toy we actually stored the uh, character's stats, the um, 
how many gold coins you had, how much experience you had, what um, what parts of the game you'd unlocked, um, all this kind of stuff. And that was all, um, all held in the little uh, tiny amount of memory that's on the... Um, on the RFID tags, and that got more and more extensive as the games progressed. Um, uh, I think we went through at least five versions of, um, of five five iterations, I should say, not versions, but five iterations of data layouts on the tags. Every year, we'd have a but we'd have new data we'd need to store on the tags, and we would allocate it, and that all had to be. Um, managed and like and stuff, and that turned out to be a pretty big part of my work for <laughs> for several years. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, like, mm-hmm. if it did evolve over the years because of you know there were more uh, there were more toys and there were more uh, there were different types of Skylanders and, and they all evolved. I was wondering if that did become a lot harder over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, each year, you know, um, it alternated between us and um, Vicarious Visions, um, and uh, and we had to, like, um, you know, we, um, Toys for Bob pretty much had the master plan for what went into the into the into the data for the toys, and we had to communicate with them and figure out what they needed, and we had to figure out what we need, and try to um, keep it in a um, a nice compact form because you've only got so many bits to store the data on the on the uh, on the toys. I think it's um a thousand. It's a thousand bytes, but what? So it's one kilobyte, but only you only get about three quarters of that. And even the three quarters of that, you kind of have to cut in half for data redundancy. So you you might end up with you know three hundred and something bytes of data, which is uh, about the about the same as in the keyboard on your computer. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. I think the the keyboard buffer on your computer might be larger than that. <laughs> so it's not very much data. Uh, so how late into development did the toys come along? Uh, pretty well. D- depends what you mean. I mean, we we were making toys. Um, for the game, for our prototypes of the game, from day one. I mean, in fact, if anything, the toys came before the game did. Um, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, because, you know, at uh, Toys for Bob, um, one of the wonderful things about working there was, if you had an interest in something, you know, they were pretty supportive about exploring it. And uh, so we had after-work hobby sessions and things like that. And one of the after-work hobby sessions, a group of people who were... Um, making making these um, toys and molds and you know we, we were people who like playing fantasy role-playing games and uh, you know Dungeons and Dragons and stuff we're, we're looking at it and saying hey I, I really like um, such and such character let's make one of those so um, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we made it we, we were making they were making little wizards there was this weird squid guy that um, Errol made and um, uh, I can't even remember them all, but some of them actually turned into, uh, into actually did turn into Skylanders. They ended up turning into Skylanders. I think um, the uh, Rock Dragon, um, whose name I can't remember because I only remember him as the development title, was one of those characters. Um, the little wizard guy didn't make it, and neither did the did the first squid guy because he was too similar to um, uh, Clang from The Simpsons. Um, uh, but uh, the, um, those those toys were basically we, we would mold them and and paint them and attach an RFID tag to them and send them down to Activision with um, the first prototypes of the game and kind of a kind of an odd story happened. Um, the toys would go down with the prototype, but they would never come back. You know, we would get this. We'd say, look, um, you know, we, we you know, can we get the toys back, please, because we're we're still working on the de- on the, the development stuff, and uh, uh, and it was like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get those back to you right away, kind of thing. What we didn't know, and, and that happened probably three or four times, and to the point where Paul, our our, um, uh, our, our studio head, was kind of unwilling to let them go at the meetings to leave them there. He wanted to bring them back because we kept having to make new ones. Um, and uh, and that you know they, they took quite a bit of effort to hand paint them and all this kind of stuff. And what we didn't know was that the 
several of the Act Activision executives were had taken some of the toys home to show their kids to get their kids reaction to them and uh and of course once they'd shown the toys to the kids the kids didn't want to let them go and you know as your parent you've given your kid a toy you are not going to take it back you know that's just not going to work and in a sense those kids became our best sales people that that reaction of the kids playing with it getting the experience of putting it into the game and the the C, the executives at, at Activision, um, you know, the, the head of finance, the head of the um, the creative heads, they all had kids in the right age range for Skylanders. They became our best salesmen. I mean, they absolutely, the, those kids' reactions convinced the executives that this was going to be a winner. And, and to that end, I'm quite glad they got those toys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So you said that you've, you've been working on a lot of the hardware did, and you were a uh, software engineer uh, beforehand. Did, did you still do any of the uh, software for the game um, or was it mainly working with the toys? Uh, I did software, I, I, w I did a lot of work on the first one. Um, my primary role on the first one was software engineering. Um, in the um, the second one was done by, was done with, done by Vicarious Visions. And so I didn't have any much programming role in that, but I did have a big role in the hardware of the, the second one. That was the swap force um, with the ch interchangeable body parts. Mm. Uh, and then in the third one, I had a lot of software role again. The fourth one went back to Vicarious Visions. By the time we got to the fifth one, I wasn't really doing any programming at all in, on the game, or very little programming on the game. I did do some. Um, we had... Uh, switched engines and and i did do a bit of work on the in in game code but nowhere near as much as i'd done on the on the, the first and third so the first second and fourth i am I'm, I'm sorry i'm conflating things the first title was uh spires adventure the second was giants and i did a lot of programming uh game programming on both of those then when it shifted to vicarious visions I, I was transitioning more to uh, the electronic side and the hardware side, and uh, um, we, we, I think between, I think the, the Skylanders product generated in the order of 30 or 40 patents, um, and I think, um, uh, you know, just as a personal note, I'm on probably 15 or 20 of those, um, and the one I'm kind of the most proud of was the one for the one for Swap Force, where we figured out how to um, how to uh, have those um, tops and bottoms be interchangeable and um, uh, uniquely identifiable and work work across. Um, uh, <laughs> it was it was challenging. Let's just say that to get those <laughs> that to to work and connect and the little magnets to hold it in place and stuff and. Uh, um, and, and at that point, I was pretty fully invested in working on the hardware. The swapping, the interchangeable swapping was awesome because I was very lucky and got to uh, see the game firsthand at E3. Um, Activision invited me and I got to play it properly and, and, and see the toys and, you know, and, and play the game. And it was just, it was so cool because, like, I just I was really impressed by the first Skylanders and then oh the second game it's Giants it's really cool it's 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 more Skylanders they're they're bigger they're better it's epic and I was just like whoa you can switch it there's so many possibilities like that that blew my mind like that was that was such a cool uh, a really really cool idea and but you were able to uh, probably uh, get it working and you know just uh, as as seamless as as you did it's it's just it was awesome. Oh, oh thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I got to give um, Vicarious Visions a lot of credit because Swap Force, um, while while we had creative differences, they did do a good job making Swap uh, with Swap Force working. That you know, like the, any two uh, organizations are going to have have um, communications and and creative differences, but um, I, I think they didn't. They did a pretty good job with Swap Force. That was that was. Um, uh, the 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 concept and the uh, execution of the game and the 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 uh, was was good. They they did a, they you know the engineers did a good job getting the uh, getting the characters to work. You know there um, there were some gotchas, but but basically it was fun and 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 it was a good it was a good product. So yeah, hats off to them.
Uh, did you encounter any really weird glitches during production? I think the short answer is yes. The long answer is I really don't remember them. But that's <laughs> yeah, it's a while yeah. back as well. Back yeah. 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 Because you, you, as you're going along with any of these projects, there are lots of little problems you have to solve, and um, oftentimes once they're solved, you just they, they just go away. <laughs> you know, mm. What was your favorite part of development? Um, I, I think um, I, I think actually probably the funnest thing we did were the light core Skylanders, um, getting the the toys to light up and glow, um, just using the um, the generated power from the portal um that was probably the funnest uh, one of the funnest things we did um the, uh or at least for, it, certainly for me um there's something absolutely magical about the toys i like because they, they first appeared in giants the giants themselves glowed and then we had little, little toys and uh and it was kind of a um a happenstance uh, uh, event what I what had happened was we were testing portals, and I needed a really quick way to determine if the portal was turned on or not, um, and and if the the software was actually turning on the the field. So a uh, uh, little bit of technical background: the RFID tag um, is not actually a radio. Um, uh, you know, it's called radio frequency identification, right? Or radio frequency identification device, something like that. The, the, the radio frequency just refers to the signal frequency, but it's not actually a radio. Um, it's actually a, a transformer. And, uh, okay, how am I going to explain this? Um, uh, essentially, it's, it's a power transfer device. It's like a wireless charger. You know how you can get wireless chargers these days. Touch your phone down on and charges it um, in that by inductive coupling. Um, basically, a little little electromagnet in the bottom sends power to a little electromagnet in the phone, and that's actually how RFID works. It it actually transfers power to the to the RFID chip and communicates with it at the same time. But the communication communication is on RFID is what they really want. But wireless chargers do the same sort of communication. And so since there was this extra excess power, I figured I could just make a little circuit that would make an LED glow. And I, I did use that to determine if the portals were on or off. There was a, I, I, if I remember right, there was some bug where the portal would stop recognizing toys. So, um, I, uh, and, and it was because the power was being turned off to the, um, to the, uh, to the to the portal, the, not not the portal itself, but to the antenna of the portal, and uh, I, um, I was working on on this and showing it, and I showed it to Iwe and said, "Hey, look, I can make this thing glow, and look how far away it can glow." And Iwe goes, "Can we put that in a toy?" I went, "Yeah, I think we could." And uh, we um, we got our our favorite toy um, for doing experiments, which was Prison Break. Um, Prison Break was the toy the the most excellent toy for doing crazy experiments on because he was pretty easy to disassemble um and we had a little hospital ward of broken prison breaks that we'd be we'd be quite literally butchered to make other toys with um and uh we built uh and uh we built an led into each um each arm each of his prism arms and glued wire to the um to the um, outside of them and painted us and like molded over it and then down into down into the base with a with a tiny little piece of um, electronics was to make him glow and he glowed and the tag and could read the tag at the same time and that actually was kind of the tr kind of a little bit tricky but it, but it worked out okay um, and uh, we showed this to people and it was like oh my gosh we've got to do that and that happened I would say probably towards the end of the Spyro's Adventure um, uh, um, development. We were probably three quarters of the way through Spyro's Adventure and the Litecore idea came up and um, Activision was at that point already talking to us about doing a sequel and said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll include it in the next, next generation. And it went from it went from an idea into development in probably less than six months. It went from yeah from from a, a concept to a 
to being built into the toys within six months, which is kind of amazing, but and really fun. I mean, so much fun to to play with these toys and have them do this magical like glow thing. <laughs> Uh, what would you say is the biggest change to how something ended in the final project? The biggest change? Yeah, it was anything that changed massively. I mean, besides the, the initial hat idea, which I'm still very much on board <laughs> with. <laughs> so I really want someone to make that now. <laughs> uh, uh, well, so when, um, when Skylanders first came up, we were charged by Activision with essentially rebooting the um, Spyro franchise and um, we so a lot of the um, early ideas for the game for games were were sort of centered around Spyro um, and the, the characters from the Spyro universe um, a few of which made it in Skylanders but but um, the, the big change there was Shifting the focus a little bit so that Spyro was part of the world, or it was a world that Spyro was a part of. And um, in order to make the toy aspect work, we needed, um, you know, we, we did need a bigger cast of characters than the Spyro universe. So, probably the biggest change from the beginning to the end was essentially a design concept change where instead of being really explicitly a Spyro game, it was a universe in which Spyro was um, a, a part. And, and I mean, he, he's definitely a big part because um, Spyro was clearly a fan favorite, but that was probably the biggest change. And um, it certainly in, internally getting that through Activision. I mean, w once we had the toys up and going, um, uh, it, it became easier and easier, and they wanted more, more and more different toys. And you know, I think the first game, I think we had thirty different toys. I, I uh, you know, honestly, I forget. I think it was thirty-two toys. Yeah, and then, I think it's uh, Yeah, and then another um, thirty-two, and because we, I think we had sixteen giants and sixteen smaller characters. So, or, you know, regular. I should shouldn't say small. I should, should say regular Skylanders. Um, uh, in Giants, so I think it, all told after the first one, I think we had 48 toys. I think that's right. Is it 48 or do we have 64? Uh, I I'm, guess I guess 64 if it was uh, two sets of 32. Yeah, I, 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 a lot. Honest, <laughs> yeah, at this point, at this point, I forget. But um, yeah, <laughs> I do remember one meeting we had where Paul had calculated that if you stacked all the boxes of toys that had been made, we actually reached the moon. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, he, wow. cal he calculated the size of the boxes and the sales figures and how many how many um, millions of toys had been sold, and realized that um, uh, that if you'd been a if you were able to stack the boxes on top of each other, they would reach the moon because the moon's only a quarter of a million miles away. So you know you only need to sell a, a million. Say toys. only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you only need to sell a million or so toys with a four-inch high box, and you reach yeah. the moon. <laughs> wow! Yeah, yeah. was that was that by the end of the first game, or? Uh, I think it was gi Giants, but um, still, though, that's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> we can reach the moon. <laughs> Crazy. Next, the sun. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yes, I don't know. I mean. Um, the other, I, I think the other title that I think people were, certainly people at Choice for Bob were the most proud of, was the was Imaginators, the final product. Mm. Uh, by that time, um, the, the, by the time we released Imaginators, Disney Infinity had already pulled out of the market, and Activision was trying, was deciding whether they were going to stay in it or not, and we put a lot of work into Imaginators, and one of the things that was just insane about Imaginators was that you could design your own Skylander, great, that's fun, but then you could 3D print it. You could actually send it off and have a 3D print made of your Skylander. So you got to put all these pieces together and, and design it, whether it was Mr. Banana Head or um, 
the you know a, a dragon or a um a unicorn or the um a you know, six-armed ape or whatever and then you could have it sent off and printed and sure that process was expensive and the result was fragile but it was super cool i mean just amazingly cool and uh, um certainly a lot of us had uh, a lot of the people in Bolt and it ended up with their own printed Skylanders. But it, it actually worked. We had the process down. Um, the, there was a the, there was fulfillment companies and um, an ordering system and the whole back end. All of the logistics that go with that was was basically sorted out. Um, and it, um, uh, I, I honestly don't know how popular it was. I know that they did sell a, la a fairly large number of prints. Um, I, I, it's probably, I'm sure it's still in the game. I mean, the, you know, obviously the, the code's still in the game. I don't think the back end still exists, though. I think they um, would, they stopped that after uh, probably a year, I think, was it, how long. But w we had plans to continue that if the series continued. We were going to continue um, uh, adding on to that theme. But it was one of the most um, creative uh, outlets you could give a kid. Just say, like, oh yeah, put these together. It's it's like a, Mr. a digital, almost a digital version of Mr. Potato Head, but with an awful lot more control. Like you know, Mr. Potato Head, you got these little plastic things you could stick into the potato in crazy places. But in uh, Imaginators, you could change the color, you could change the size, change the scale. Um, they animated. Uh, I mean, it was uh, um, you chose your own. Um, uh, voice and special and special effects and um, oh my gosh, all the stuff and all of that data fit on a tag. By the way, all of that data fit in that one K tag. You know, <laughs> that's so impressive. <laughs> yeah, we did a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I when I saw that, it was just like that was that's the dream, right? Like, yeah. like Skylanders has evolved so much. It's just like you can actually make your own. Like, I I mean, we always wanted it, but I didn't think it was going to happen. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and and we had plans for doing it. I think we had had um, the idea was we would do if if we did Imaginators two, it would probably be um, uh, it would have been four legged critters. So it would have included actually I, I, that I spoke misspoke earlier. Uh, that would have included dragons and unicorns and um, uh, centaurs and all uh, all of the four legged things would would have been added. Um, we already you know the, I think the first one already had wings, but um, the game didn't really uh, allow for flying as such. There wasn't a flight mode. But be that as it may, you could make the characters, which was which was super cool. And we, we had a couple of guys there that did some amazing technical work to support that, um, both in terms of the um, uh, the, the graphics and the. Um, uh, like making the objects be 3D printable is is actually an effort. If you've if you've worked with 3D printers, um, getting stuff to 3D print reliably is is a challenge. Getting uh, 5,000 pieces of graphic artwork to print together reliably is an even bigger challenge. You know, just so that they all they would fit together, they would. Um, intersect the, the, the they'd be thick enough to support their own weight. There's so many challenges involved in doing that, and uh, um, people solved it. Um, the team, the team, that you know, there were individuals who did did fantastic um, efforts, um, and even um, like figuring out how to send the data to the, um, the company to order it from required some. Um, um, uh, some incredible pieces of, of technological development to make that all work, um, and then the logistics of getting the the stuff together, the packaging. Um, it, it was it was a, a, a massive effort, and I think actually quite successful. And I think likely would have been very successful if um, it, if it had followed up, if it had been followed up another year. So obviously, you you spent many many years working uh on skylanders uh all, all of the games uh, what have you been working on since then um well uh, uh, when skylanders was um like coming up on like five six years i was feeling like you know what it's going to be hard to top this <laughs> this uh there's no uh th there's no game project that um i can think of that would do 
better than than we've done with Skylanders. I think I might just retire when Skylanders is done, and that's what I did. I so I stepped back and and I haven't really worked in the industry since then. Um, and and several of the other people involved in Skylanders also have done things like that. I think the guys that I'm I'm kind of really proud of um, uh, uh, as a number of the designers and animators after Skylanders instead of they stayed in games but they're now working in um what you might call medical rehabilitation products so they're um they they, they found um, work at a company that is making um they're doing basically it's it's they make devices and uh support stuff for people recovering from debilitating injuries um and, and a variety of things like that. And they're building games that encourage people to move. So they put on a VR, a virtual reality suit, or, or, or even just a, a hand a glove. And um, they're inside a virtual reality environment, and it's encouraging them to exercise, to manipulate, to um, get their, uh, um, re to retrain their muscles and, and um, get their physical therapy, and that's done in a, in a um, kind of a fun game environment. And I look at that and go, that's amazing. That that I mean, we we had um, a number of Make a Wish events for kids um, in Skylanders that were really um, heartwarming events, and that um, really did affect people, people um, particularly within the organization. But but obviously, you know, projecting it outside the organization, it did. It did some great good for a lot of kids who were in hospitals. We were donating games and toys to, to hospitals and children's centers all over the place. And uh, um, uh, Gaurav, who was one of the leaders on this, um, got heavily involved and uh, has gotten heavily involved in building software for rehabilitation of, pe of people from, from strokes, from um, uh, degenerative diseases, all, all kinds of stuff. and. They're um, making recovery fun, you know, trying to get people to recover from um, uh, um, accidents and, and things. And and it's so cool. And, and it's like, okay, that's a great way to step from a you know top of the world <clears throat> top of the <clears throat> top of the world game to uh, you know what do you do next? And and so I'm really happy for those guys. I think they they're doing fantastic. Yeah, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, I guess finally, uh, do you have any advice for fellow engineers who are trying to get into the industry? What you do is more important than um, uh, like your education is important, but getting into the industry, showing what you can do, is more important than um, saying what you can do. So. Like a resume is good, but um, uh, do something, create something, um, show a the start of a product, the start of um, something. Um, even if you're using stock art, if you're just using Unity or Unreal or um, uh, or coding it by hand, whatever you're doing, um, have something to show rather than um, just. Uh, th than, than tell. So it's much more important to show that you can do something and and particularly um, if you you know if you've uh, polished it and made it look made it good, then you've run into all of the a lot of you'll have run into a lot of the issues that face software engineering in video game. Um, it, you know things like user interface. Um, why did you choose to you know why did you choose to let the character? Um, die and be reborn or doing something and creating something will help you be able to answer those questions because you're going to have to solve those questions yourself so you'll already have a leg up over everybody else who's never faced them before so so um, just do it <laughs> well that is absolutely incredible thank you very much for joining me uh, and being a part of this project uh, it is a tremendous honor um, and it's been fascinating to hear uh, the, your your stories about development and, and what you've been up to. And just thank you so much for your contribution to the games because it's, I mean, they, they've 
they've they've made me happy. Um, I've I've loved playing the Skylander series, and I'm sure uh, many people watching uh, also feel the same way. And I'm sure many people watching also um, are people who are looking forward to uh, embarking into the industry. Um, and I'm sure it's uh, uh, you and everyone else who who's joined this project. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, they you've you've made quite a wonderful impression uh, about how 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 brilliant this industry is. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it really is a great industry. I mean, and, and, and the ability to express creativity is fantastic. And, and one of these days, we'll, we'll, somebody will make a game with, with, with changeable hats, <laughs> with wearing hats. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Excellent! <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you would like to support me and the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a massive passion project of mine that I've been working on for quite some time, and I'm really glad that I'm able to get it out to you, and I'm really grateful for you watching the video. If you want to see more from the series or other stuff that I do on this channel, click that notification bell to be notified when I upload next. But thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>